Hello, everybody, and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. Today, we'll talk about how to secure GraphQL APIs. And with me is Francois Lasse of ASF. Hey, Francois, thanks for joining. Hi, Eric. Great, great to be here. Yeah, it was it was it was kind of funny to introduce you as being from Layer Seven because that has a company that we have a long history with, and now the name is getting used again. So we'll talk about GraphQL and kind of how to use GraphQL. I would say in enterprise settings. So GraphQL has a, I think, in the meantime, kind of a long history, but it's a little newer in the enterprise context. So. Could you briefly talk us through the specific challenges of GraphQL in the enterprise context, in particular the security ones, I guess? Yeah. <clears throat> so the first thing I'd say is from a security perspective, we got used to accepting certain things that came with REST. Uh, you know, REST APIs had a reliable way of using uh, certain HTTP level characteristics for security purposes, and that doesn't work in GraphQL anymore. Those those HTTP characteristics kind of lose their status with GraphQL, so that is a little bit falling apart in some cases. Yeah, and I guess you're right that like it's it's almost like with REST APIs, we have kind of the usage model of the the traditional web. Right where it's one resource, you go there, and this may be access yeah. controlled and so forth. Then you get to the next resource, and and you're traversing these things, and all of this falls apart with GraphQL, where you're always going to the same resource, and this does everything for you. It's like you're going to the Facebook page, whatever, right? And you you'll stay on there forever, hopefully not, but for a long time because yeah. you always get new resources from that one point. Yeah, that's right, and. So there's there's the resource that you're talking about, which is a transport characteristic. That's one of them, and it's a really important one, right? So, uh, what resource am I acting on in in REST? You're looking at the URI, and we accept that as a convention that informs us about the resource we're acting on. GraphQL doesn't do that. The the, the resource that you're asking on uh, acting on is not part of the URL in any way. So that's a big mm -hmm. difference for sure. Yeah, you're just kind of always accessing the one endpoint that gives you everything, right? So so just access exactly. controlling on that would be a little bit shallow. Well, it, it, it means that from an access control perspective, if you're doing coarse grain access control and there's a rule that takes into consideration the resource, now you have to dig a little deeper. You can't just take a look at the HTTP URI and say that's the resource. You need some sort of GraphQL awareness something that will inform you about what you're acting on and that's if you think about middleware that you know apply some of these rules on behalf of apis a lot of that middleware is http aware right they don't have to understand a lot about the api if they understand enough about http you have enough information to craft some coarse grain authorization rules um so that's why it's such a disruption that these HTTP characteristics, mm -hmm. like the like the resource URI, um, yeah, that falling apart is is definitely a disruption for the enterprise. And it's interesting to see. I remember a couple of years ago, I saw I think initial work coming out of IBM, and we linked to that from the description. They were looking into some of these problems, and now you're. With layer seven as part of Broadcom, right? You, I, you kind of had the same customer segment, right? Typical enterprise yeah. customers who want to serve a lot of things through GraphQL. And then, of course, the question is how how do we get machinery that allows us to do these things? And your traditional API gateway just won't be able to do that. So, so what are the kind of capabilities that you're now looking mm -hmm. into that you need to to get to the same levels of access control? that you want, but then for GraphQL APIs. Yeah, so in order to make up for that loss of context, you need to inject a little, a little bit of uh, graph intelligence, if you want, in the gateway. Something that allows a policy author to be able to say, you know, for example, is it a query or is it a mutation, right? Or is, is the response an error? Or is it a success? Those are all, you know, we talked about the URI, but there are other HTTP characteristics uh, 
like the error, right? Is it an HTTP status code 200 or 500, right? This is the kind of stuff that with REST, you could, you could just take a look at that. Now you need to look at actually the payload. Hey, let's look at the payload. Is this an error or is this a success? Um, in the case of the method, right? HTTP method, get, put, post, delete, that would inform you, are you writing to something? Are you reading? Now you need to like, take a look at inside the GraphQL syntax. Is it a query? Is it a mutation? What kind of mutation? So yeah, to answer your question, we, we are injecting some GraphQL context inside the, uh, the gateway that allows you to be able to make rules based on this information that's otherwise buried a, a level deeper. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes like a, a policy language that is payload aware, so to speak, which I guess in most gateways, to some extent, they would still do that, right? They Sometimes they allow you to inspect a little bit what's in the JSON yes. or whatever it is that you're, but it's a different level, I would say, of inspection that you need now. It's a different level. And what you said is is like one another really key difference between REST and GraphQL, the payload, right? So. GraphQL is supposed to, everything's in JSON, right? The, the, the request is in JSON, the response is in JSON. So, you know, a lot of REST APIs are also JSON. So we are, we're used to parsing JSON and looking for patterns and, and using these patterns and set rules around them. But the problem with GraphQL is that on the request side, a lot of information is one property inside of JSON, and then you've got the entire GraphQL query in there. And so the JSON parsing by itself is not sufficient. You need to go inside the JSON property and parse a GraphQL query to get the information that you're looking for. So it's even a level deeper than the payload in some cases. Mm -hmm. It's definitely mm -hmm. buried uh, deeper, yeah. <clears throat> so in terms of just readiness that what you're working on is it already part of the your product is it like do you have a roadmap where you have some features now and some are coming later i'm just curious you know how far along you are yeah so we've we released a couple of um uh basic capabilities in the gateway so far one uh that allows you to validate a graphql schema so you can take a graphql schema and its own graphql uh, schema language you can take ownership of it you can tweak it and then you can tell the gateway this is the schema i want to validate right and then you can take actions uh based on whether or not the the the, the request coming through is uh you know valid according to a specific schema so that's the first one we added and then we also added a way to parse an inline mutation argument so that you can more easily figure out what are you acting on as part of a mutation. So that allow, that requires uh, GraphQL specific uh, parsing. Uh, so mm -hmm. those are the two that we've introduced so far uh, in our gateway. And those are based on customer use cases um, that you know are coming from our customers. So you know mm -hmm. we have customers that are starting to deploy GraphQL at, on mass and uh they are running into some of these challenges and we're reacting to that and uh, yeah it's great to be part of that yeah i'm sure you have a pretty interesting backlog there <laughs> all the things you could be doing so one last thing i also would like to briefly mm. discuss because you're looking into all these things right it's not just yeah. access control so to speak but or it's i mean that's also security but if you look at these whole denial of service things right so we all read about mm -hmm. graphql like the potential complexity of these queries because they yeah. can be arbitrarily complex to some extent yes and then the question is how do you manage this is this something that you have on your roadmap you've already looked into or how do how are you dealing with this kind of security issue yes um definitely so yeah it, you're right it's not just security right so it, anything that has to do with a, a rate limit or a quota is is disrupted as well by a little bit by graphql because in graphql you can have as many uh graphql queries as you want in a single one you can put them together you can ask for a little bit of data or a lot of data right so from a security perspective anywhere where you're used to in your rest apis saying that maybe a category of users not allowed to do more than X transactions per second, right? Whenever you have like transactions per second as part of a rule, 
you got to ask yourself, is this, is this correct for my GraphQL API? Because now what is the cost of, of a request is very, um, it, 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 it can be a little or it can be a lot. So um, from, from the perspective of protecting your API and making sure that there's not like a million transactions a second, yeah, that definitely changes, but not just security because quotas and rate limits is a way that you are setting up a contract with your developers, right? Sometimes maybe you're monetizing your APIs or maybe you're just having different tiers of usage. So you're used to telling your customers, hey, you know, for my basic API plan, you can only call 100 requests mm -hmm. a second, let's say. So if you need to change that because of GraphQL, you, now you need to explain to your developers what is, you know, how do you calculate, you know, people come up with like query points instead of transactions per second, some sort of different metric, right? Yeah, I've seen this somewhere where they had almost like a, a layer system of credits, right? It's like this yes. kind of query will use That's up right. this many credits and then your math actually becomes, so to speak, a little bit more complicated because it's not yes. the number of requests, but the number of credits that you use, which can vary widely. But I guess that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense. The problem is that it, it, you can make it complicated for the developer to understand what is the cost of a query, right? And uh, it's it, it can also add complexity to your model. So if, uh, if you're not ready to go there, but you recognize that transactions per second is not a very useful metric for your GraphQL API, instead of counting transactions per second, a really simple uh you know fallback is just to count the, the 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 data that comes back from your request over time right just volume yeah just volume instead of number yeah. of requests right how many megabytes are you pulling and uh you can you can associate you know if you want your rate limit to that there's probably a good good enough correlation right by by and large i would guess i think that works well for most people yeah yeah to avoid yeah. complexity so one last question, because you have, you know, so many interesting insights into this and you're working with real customers, you know, asking for these kind of things. Can you disclose just a rough estimate? You know, how many of your customers are interested in it or are already using it? Is that like a like a slice that you want to serve, but that is smaller? Or do you see that as something that really becomes kind of mainstream almost for your um, bigger customers? These days, I hear some customers use words like we're standardizing on GraphQL, right? Like these actual Ooh. words. Uh, okay. So we have customers that are doing that. And I would say that in the mo for the most part at the moment, those customers are leveraging GraphQL for what they perceive being internal APIs as opposed to public APIs. Um, but you know from a zero trust perspective you're supposed to ha also secure your private api it's important right so it doesn't matter that the security implications are necessarily lower uh but that is a starting point um and uh we see the odd customer exposing graphql apis on the public interface as well um but at the moment i would say most customers are using graphql in their environment to a certain degree and a minority of customers are actually standardizing on that and mm -hmm. they're very enthusiastic about it. Interesting. But I, I, I think that matches with how GraphQL, so to speak, came about, right? It came about as kind of this internal back end and then like more and more use cases yes. showed up as well. Actually, it could work there as well. And we, we see that it definitely is still gaining momentum. Yeah, and if you think about GraphQL being so appreciated by the client side developers, um, it does make sense that it would be used for public APIs, right? It's 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 targeting client side developers. So uh, if it makes the client side developers happy, that's a good reason for adopting it, in my opinion. That's very true. I think it still is a question of you know what your target audience of those client side yeah. developers look like. Um, but if, if that target audience is close to, to app development and these kind of things, then I, I guess that's, yeah, that's a pretty strong argument to be made. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, 
some of the implications from a security perspective of GraphQL is, is come from the fact that you're, you're putting a lot more control into the hands of the client side developer. Um, and so uh, by putting more control there, you need to validate more on the server side. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so on the other hand, uh, a, a positive impact of that is that you are more likely to solve your own problem on the client side if you have more control. Uh, therefore, I would predict that GraphQL as a choice will allow your API to be more stable over time because you have the ability to do different and new things just by changing how you query on the client side without necessarily having to change the API. So there's a little bit more stability over time, uh, I predict in this case. That's an interesting aspect, actually, but we won't talk about this now mm -hmm. because we already spent Next time. it. <laughs> okay. But it's a really interesting conversation, actually. You know, it's like, how does GraphQL allow you to have more stable APIs? So um, I think I'll just have you back on here for this. Sounds session. good. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks, Fonsa. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. I'll put some of the references that we mentioned into the description of this video. And that's it for today. Thanks a lot and see you soon. Bye. Thanks.